Welcome to the Love Lab podcast, a safe place to get real about sex. Whether you're man, woman, single or couple, this is the show for you because well, sex matters. We are your hosts, Kevin Anthony and Celine Remy. Welcome back to the Love Lab podcast and this is episode 31 and today we're going to be discussing the pleasure principle with a special guest, Amy Waterman. I am so excited to be able to talk about pleasure. I like to say pleasure is my business, and today we have another pleasure expert, and I know she's super pumped and charged and can't wait to share with us all of her wisdom. Uh, but if you've never heard of Amy Waterman, then let's just, just we're just going to give you the two seconds little bio so you get to know her. She is Amy Waterman's dating and relationship advice has been featured in over a dozen books and online courses. She's been writing for women since 2005, focusing on the way in which the latest scientific research has totally transformed our understanding of love and relationships. And I really love that. I love that she's bringing in the scientific research. So it's not just like all woo-woo and pleasure and rainbow and butterfly, but we've got the real deal and science behind. So welcome, Amy. Hello, Celine. Hello, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you, everybody out there for watching or listening. I hope that you become one of our Pleasure Posse members by the end of this show. Mm. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, let's dive right into the questions. And my first question uh, is, you've been researching uh, love, attraction, relationships for over a decade. And I'm really curious, how did you end up doing that? How did you end up in this field? <laughs> well, this is going to be kind of a crazy story. I hope you're up for it. So when I graduated from college way back in the mid 1990s, my goal was to work on sheep farms around the world and write about them. Uh, so yeah, I, I re- this honestly, and that's what I did. So I went to Wales, I went to um, South America, I went to Australia, worked on sheep farms, wrote a ton. And I was getting older, I was going to be 29. And I was running out of time to get these international work visas. So there was one last country I hadn't been to would give me a work visa that was a sheep country and it was New Zealand. So I arrived in New Zealand ready to find work on a sheep farm. And I could not find a job on a sheep farm because they were all going to local Kiwis. So I saw, saw, this is, I know this is a crazy story, but I saw an ad in the paper for Native American speakers. And so I answered that and I said, you know, hold on, but I don't speak like Navajo or anything like that. Like, no, 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 no. We just mean like an American speaker. And it was this little internet company uh, based in New Zealand. And they were looking for people to help them create info products for the American market. And one of the products they were already selling was a dating guide for men and women. And I was like, oh, you mean I could be the next Carrie Bradshaw? Really? Really? <laughs> and they said, sure, if you want to be here, go buy all the books in the library you want to buy and or, you know, in the bookstore you want to buy and you can you can write all you want about relationships. And I was thrilled. I read everything there was to read, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just sad. I was thinking, man, you know, I've, I've left behind my dream of being the writer on international sheep farming, but in exchange, <laughs> I got to be somebody who wrote about relationships and that's the story. <laughs> you know, I, I never would have guessed that, <laughs> but it's very cool. It's very cool. I love the way that, that life just sort of uh, happens, you know, like our, all of our paths are so different in how we end up where we are. Um, so, so you gave up your dream to write about sheep farming. You got into yep. doing relationships. And, and so now how many years have you actually been researching and writing about this? Yeah, well, I started back in 2005. And these are the days I, you know, I call myself an old timer in the field of dating relationships. And I feel it like those were the days where, you know, Barbara DeAngelis was still writing about relationships. Um, All these, you know, the rules was still people still talked about the rules. Um, He's not he's just not that into you had come out. And now when we look at that material, we think, man, that's old fashioned. (laughs) Man, you know, that stuff is so old. And what has happened? And this is the thing that really excites me. What I have seen is the science explodes. So back when I started out, we were really looking at uh, the experts that we were looking at were people who were kind of the agony ants. You know, they were people who made a living. They were nice people who gave nice advice about nice things that you did. And really, that's all 
they had to go on was the advice people have been giving, you know, for the past hundred years of dating. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that dating is an American invention and it's not much more than a hundred years old. So all the dating advice you have that is this old fashioned classic dating advice, it's not any more than a hundred years old. So remember that. So, so all this time we've been going based off from what everybody always says, then something started to happen. And I would say people like Kinsey showed the way. They said, hey, instead of saying what people ought to do in bed, why don't we research what they actually do in bed and then maybe make decisions based off from what's actually happening? And the same thing started to happen with dating. Suddenly, people were getting, researchers were getting funding to study some of this stuff. And suddenly, there was a possibility of giving advice based on research rather than what all these agony ants have been saying for the past few decades. And where it really came into its own is in the last, I'd say the last five years or so, when everybody moved en masse to online dating. And suddenly what we've got are these massive online data sets of how people are actually interacting with each other, going out on dates. And suddenly there's a massive body of, of, of research that they can actually tell us what is actually going on. And so I now believe that anybody who's giving you advice based off from what everybody has always said, you know, we're not living in the dark ages. You know, we don't explain that, you know, the gods are causing the weather. So why are we, why are we going off on what people said? Let's look at the science. Let's look at the data and then make our decisions based off from that. Mm. So it's interesting because now that science is coming into it and we have data, so we know that in terms of attraction, what really works is like we have the other prints, right? Like smell is very important. But when yeah. you think of online dating, people just base their attraction based on a picture or on a profile or, you know, and, and often it can be totally like far off from who they really are because you can really make up anything that you want online. And so what I'm really curious about too is like okay so online dating works but then if we bring if we bring the research and data it shows that actually it's missing the very important component of the smell of meeting the person so how do we like bridge the gap between these two so we know with what research shows what works but then the way we're dating is still not bridging that gap yeah, well, this is great because there's actually, that's exactly what scientists are saying. You know, they're saying that one of the biggest problems with online dating is that what we're dating is a vision in our head. Mm -hmm. We are projecting our fantasy onto this person. And then, of course, when we meet, our fantasy is, you know, rudely interrupted by reality. And so they've got lots of information like how long should you talk online before meeting? What should your perspective be? Here's a really fun study. They have done, this actually study was done for anti-aging. So I'm also, that's one of my interests is uh, how to stay young and what keeps us living a long time. And they've done a number of studies on what, whether people are smiling in their college or high school yearbook photos. <laughs> so they've, they've done this on uh, young women in their high school yearbook photos. And they've done this on um, baseball players, which is kind of interesting. People who give genuine smiles in their photos. This is called the Duchenne smile. You know, the one where your eyes crinkle a little bit and, you know, your eyes kind of squint. You don't really look as attractive, but you're actually really smiling. We can, we can notice that. People who genuinely smile in photographs get married sooner at a younger age. Their marriages are happier. They're less likely to divorce and they live longer. Oh, this is The really less happy good. somebody appears in their photos the more likely they will end up divorced and they won't live as long. I'm gonna have now to go. that's interesting and that's relevant to online dating. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to have to go back to my high school yearbook and see what my smile was like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I was smiling because I always am. And I always think, oh my God, I'm smiling so much. I have all these wrinkles, but now I see like, it's actually a good thing. This is why I have a happy marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies, all those ladies out there who are, attracted to men who have that brooding look in photos, you might think twice. Those, those dark, handsome, scowling men may not actually be the perfect husband. Oh, oh my God. This is a juicy piece of advice there, Amy. Thank you. It's a very juicy piece of advice because I know so many women who always go for the bad boy. Yes. They always go for the one that's sort of either semi-depressed or angry or whatever it is because there's there's that piece about wanting some 
form of masculinity that comes with that. But I love how you're sort of reframing that and realizing that, hey, you know, people who who have that sort of way of being, that mentality, may not make the best partners. (laughs) Well, let's just go back to pleasure and let's talk about pleasure for a moment. Who's going to be the person who's going to put a smile on your face and make you happy? Mm -hmm. Is it the guy who broods and scowls or is it the guy who has a cheeky grin that kind of makes him look a little bit silly, but just totally adorable? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I love how you're bringing it over to pleasure, though, because you actually wrote a book called The Pleasure Principle, and I understand there's going to be a sequel to that coming soon, too. Absolutely. So I so I want to just give a little bit about my background. You know, of course, that I was into sheep farming for quite a long time. So I come from a background of hardworking people. My uh, father's ancestors came across Oregon in a covered wagon. We are pioneers. We work hard. We work off the land. We are very traditional in our gender roles. The women bake huge meals. They support the, the their husbands. And so I grew up having very conservative values. I believed that a person's worth was measured based on whether they valued hard work more or whether they valued fun and entertainment and fluffy stuff more. And the people who worked hard all the time and never took time off to have a vacation and never took time off to have any fun, those were the people that were better than everyone else. Those were the people I should be. And so I lived my life like that because I thought, well, you know, this is how I grew up. This is how it should be. I ended up graduating second in my class, university, struggling with burnout the whole way. Everything I did, I threw myself in 100%. And I said, you know what? I don't need time for have fun. I don't need time for pleasure because I'm a hard worker. This is the values of my people. This is what I do. And I ended up getting to a point in my life where I ended up, you know, I had a daughter and she was the one who really woke me up one day. Uh, she's quite little. She's grade school now, but this happened a couple of years ago when she was still, still a preschooler. And, uh, so I'm a single mom. So I work a lot because when I'm not working, of course, I'm doing stuff around the house and trying to sort her out. And she looked at me one day and she said, mommy, we don't have any fun anymore. And she had that look on her face that was quite emotional, you know, with a little kid. And I hear I had, you know, my arms full of laundry, you know, walking back and forth. And I thought, oh, my God. (laughs) No, we don't have any fun anymore. But, hey, I get you off to school on time. (laughs) You know, I keep your clothes clean. I keep all this. And at the time, it it was really good timing because at the time I was doing a lot of research on youth, on staying young, what keeps people young, what keeps people healthy, what makes them live a long time. And I'd been reading people like Dr. Christian Northrup, uh, Goddesses Never Age. And I was starting to see this theme crop up. And it was the theme of pleasure. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Christian Northrup uh, looks at pleasure in terms of how it boosts a chemical called nitric oxide in the body. And this is basically all this little chemical does really simple. It just relaxes blood vessels. But if you think about what happens when your blood vessels are relaxed, your blood flow really improves, your circulation improves. And uh, guys may know that this is actually how Viagra works. Viagra works by boosting nitric oxide, which relaxes things and makes the blood flow there and and everything works nicely. But the problem with nitric oxide is that uh, once you use it up, it's gone, right? Your body can't store it, so you have to keep on producing it. And as people get older, they produce less and less of it. So their bodies don't work as well and their health isn't as good because they're not getting that blood flow and that circulation. So what can we do to boost nitric oxide? Well, there's a a couple things, eat leafy green vegetables, but one of the most reliable sources is pleasure. Like, hmm, hmm, maybe she's talking to me. (laughs) (laughs) And I started looking into it even more. And what I learned was that my upbringing that said pleasure is an option, pleasure is for scoundrels, pleasure is for those bad people who aren't good like us, was actually majorly affecting my health, affecting my well-being, and ultimately affecting my ability to parent. And so I made a vow that I was going to try and bring this message to as many people as possible. Yeah. Oh, oh, that brutal honesty of children. (laughs) 
But, you know, I, I love that that's how you came to this. Like when I was reading your book, I, I kind of called it the aha moment, right? That moment where all of a sudden you made a connection and, that, and you looked at the past of your life and you saw, oh my God, I get it now. I do. And the worst thing is, once you make that connection, you start looking around at the women you know, and you know, the news and the movies you watch and what you see, you see so many women trying to do it all. Mm -hmm. So many women trying to do it all right. They're trying to get their home, just like, you know, all the crafts and all the decorating like in Pinterest. And they're trying to cook really good, you know, organic, healthy food. And they're trying to make sure that their partners are satisfied in bed and that they're doing the right things to keep their relationship alive. And then they're trying to make sure their kids are growing up right and they're giving values and their kids are having a fun. And then they're trying to work hard and make sure they advance in their careers. <laughs> and they're just exhausted. Mm -hmm. You know, this reminds me of uh, the chapter in the book where you talk about self-care. Maybe you could explain to the listeners how that relates, like how self-care is so important in this whole thing. Yeah. One of the things that we don't get is we think self-care is, you know, there's a lovely quote and I'm not going to be able to think about it, but it's something like we think self-care is all, you know, Epsom salt baths and chocolates, but it's actually a radical revolutionary act because what self-care says is I'm important and I matter. And that may not be revolutionary to some people, people who have an easy time putting themselves first, maybe guys think, well, well. but women have, especially women growing up with traditional gender roles, like I did, we were raised to believe that our responsibility was to serve, it was to serve our husbands, was to serve our employer, was to be of value and of use to people. And that made us feel good. When I can make something, someone smile, I feel great. And so I think, well, because I feel great, that's all I need to do. What if we suddenly said, right, my job isn't to make all these other people happy. My job isn't to be who all these other people say I should be. My job is to honor myself and put myself first sometimes. Mm -hmm. My job is to think about the fact that selfish has the word self in it. And myself isn't a bad thing. It isn't something that I should put aside because it's dirty and yucky and the only thing that matters are other people's selves. No, myself, myself matters and I can be selfish. And so that's what self-care is about. You know, we, we often think that self-care is, oh, you know, go get a manicure or pedicure every so often. But self-care is learning that you matter and often you matter more than the other people in your life. Now, that's kind of radical, right? Because like those of us who are heads of families, we think, well, I don't matter more than my daughter. I don't matter more than my husband. Um, if anything, you know, my job is to support them. But, you know, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> those sort of quotes we laugh at, but there's a lot of truth. The way we treat ourselves is, is how our children are watching this, right? They're watching how we treat ourselves and they're saying, when I grow up, I'll treat myself like my mummy treats herself. Does my mummy say I feel fat? Well, then probably when I'm a grown up, I'm going to think I'm fat too. Does mummy say, oh, I'm so tired. Why don't you kids just go get your stuff and, and fix everything? And, you know, I just got to sit down and she's mad because she's working so hard. Well, probably that's normal. And when I grow up, I'm going to be like that. We don't realize that the way we talk about ourselves and the way we treat ourselves is probably the most important thing in the world because our families are watching us and we're affecting them. So yeah, I mean it's it's huge. Self-care is 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 radical. It's political and every single woman should prioritize it. Yeah, I like to always use the analogy of um, the oxygen things that come down in an emergency on a plane, right? They always tell you put yours on first before you yeah. help anybody else. Because how do we really show up whether it's for our children or for our partner in romantic relationship? How do we really do that effectively if we're tired, we're burnt out, we're depleted, like we're, we're on the edge of, of snapping all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So we really need yeah. to take care of ourselves. I'm really curious though, as I'm listening, because as a woman, uh, I can relate to that a lot. And a lot of my work is around pleasure as well. But I'm curious for all our male listeners and the male right here, we have Kevin, like, how does pleasure land? Like, I'm so curious how like men relate to pleasure versus how we relate. I know how I relate to it, but how, how, yeah, what comes up for you when you hear that word pleasure? Can you relate to that? Yeah, I can relate to it. I probably think of it differently than you do. 
So, you know, like in our relationship, um, you know, we talk about, you know, man cave time or, you know, we made a joke in a talk that we gave recently about man cave and she shed time, right? Mm-hmm. So, so for me, the way that shows up is like, you know, having time here in our little studio to just play guitar or to, you know, go work out or go mountain biking or something like that. So those are ways that, that I would go do something that's pleasurable for me that allows me to de-stress. Mm and then be able to show up better. Yeah. Do you have any um, any studies on that, Amy, in terms of like if they've done it, like looking at it across gender? Well, my definition of pleasure is very, very specific, and it's very scientific, and it's the same across genders, so there's no difference. So for me, pleasure is a physical experience. It's a bodily sensation. So a lot of people may say things like, well, it's pleasurable to get drunk right? Or it's Mm. pleasurable to get high or it's pleasurable to zone out in front of the TV, right? So under my definition, pleasure is something that activates what I call chill mode, the parasympathetic nervous system response. So we've got, we've got two modes in our body. We've got what I call freak mode and we've got what I call chill mode. And the important thing to remember is when one's on, the other's off, they cannot be on at the same time. So freak mode is your sympathetic nervous system. And that is, you know, people, a lot of people know it as fight or flight, right? When you're stressed, you go into freak mode, right? You, you, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, you start to sweat, you feel nervous. Everything ramps up in order to ready you for whatever action you need to take. And at that same time, your body shuts down anything that's not essential. And two of the things it shuts down are digestion and reproduction. Now, reproduction, we'll recall, that's our sexiness. Sexiness is reproduction. So the minute you stress, your sexy vibes are gone. Your body shuts them off like that. So the other side of the coin is chill mode. And this is the sympathetic, this is the parasympathetic nervous system. It comes in, it calms everything down. Some people call it the relaxation response. Your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down, you relax, and your body can digest food better. And you're ready to reproduce, which means, ooh, those hot and sexy vibes, come on. Now, there's a lot of ways to get you into chill mode. Uh, Meditation is great. Yoga is great. And so you'll hear doctors saying you need to de-stress. You need to do all these things to calm you down. But a busy woman thinks, oh, my gosh, more stuff. I might be like, can't do it. (laughs) What doctors don't tell you is that there's a very simple way to turn on your relaxation response. And that is pleasure. So when you experience pleasure that's idiosyncratic and unique to you, it triggers the relaxation response in your body. And that's how you know this is genuine pleasure. But what's interesting is that uh, companies and and the media have wanted to hijack pleasure. They've wanted to say, if you buy this shampoo and you wash your hair with this shampoo, you'll have this orgasmic experience. So you buy the shampoo and you wash your hair with the shampoo and a shampoo. Right. But oh, but I'm supposed to be feeling pleasure because your shampoo smells like is it triggering the relaxation response? If not, it ain't pleasure, at least not for you. So one of the most important things to understand about pleasure, you can't buy it. Other people can't tell you what's pleasurable. Mm. It's entirely unique to every single individual. And it's the thing that you experience that makes you ah, relax. And the way this connects to love and relationships is, of course, if you're not relaxed and feeling that response, it's really hard to feel sexy. It's really hard to feel turned on. And it's really hard to create chemistry. And so this is one of my mission is, of course, to 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 look at dating advice and say, hold on a second. A lot of this dating advice is making us feel pressured. It's making us Mm -hmm. feel stressed and it's activating our freak mode. Let's instead look at ways we can activate our chill mode on dates and in relationships. And that is how we're going to create chemistry. Mm, what a great definition. I, I think it was very inspiring. And, and hopefully our listeners will really start to see that and feel that in their lives. I know before we started our interview, you were uh, very excited about sharing with us and our audience more of the different connection of pleasure love pleasure diets and you had all these different aspects and element of how pleasure shows and affects those different areas so we'd love uh just to hear a little bit more about that (laughs) fantastic well i just talked about that uh in chill mode one of the things that you know your reproduction system gets turned on again and digestion so 
we've got a lot of people out there who weigh more than they feel they should. And one of the really interesting things is that despite the fact that so many Americans weigh a little bit more than they should, 85% of us are malnourished. Mm. How does that work? How can you weigh too much and be malnourished? So a lot of people might say, well, it's because our food doesn't have the nutrients in it or we're eating the wrong things. But there is another piece of the puzzle that you're not hearing. And this comes from Mark David. It comes from the Institute for Psychology of Eating, which I you know, urge everyone to check out. And what he's made a very simple connection. We can put food in our mouths, right? And we've got the nutrition facts, right? If we eat this food, it's going to give us this many calories, this much protein, this much fat. What if that's not true? Because between putting food in your mouth and the nutrients going through the rest of your body, there's a crucial thing happening, digestion. And digestion is influenced by whether you're in chill mode or freak mode. Because when you're in freak mode, digestion shuts down. And anything you're eating when you're stressed, it could be the most nutritionally balanced meal in the world. But you're in freak mode, you're stressed, digestion is working, you're not going to get all the nutrition from what you just ate. And you may end up being malnourished, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the amazing thing. You're eating this amazing dinner that probably has way too much fat and calories. Oops. And you are so happy because you're sitting with your friends and you're laughing and you're having the best time because it's just so great. And your body's in chill mode and your digestion system is just working at its top. And you're getting so much nutrition from that meal that wasn't as nutritionally perfect as the other one you ate. Now, this sounds like, whoa, how could this be? They've actually studied it. And one study that uh, to this day, I, I just can't believe this, it worked like this. They got two groups of women. They got some Thai women and some Swedish women. And they fed both groups of women a traditional Thai meal. And then they measured the iron levels in their blood. And they found that the Thai women absorbed all the iron in the meal. The Swedish women, for whom this was a really exotic strange thing to eat, only absorbed half the amount of iron. And they said, okay, well, maybe it has something to do with the Thai food, right? So they switched it. They fed both groups of women a traditional Swedish meal. Again, the Swedish women for whom this food was just really comfortable and wonderful, they absorbed all the iron in the meal. The Thai women for whom this was just like, I don't know about this, they absorbed half the amount of iron. So our emotional state while we're eating affects how well our food gets digested and whether that nutrition goes to the survivor. Even worse, it affects fat storage. So if you're stressed, if you're in freak mode when you eat, more of that food's going to get stored as fat than if you were relaxed. So what does that mean about the diet industry? The diet industry asks us to eat foods, the very unusual and strange to us, it asks us to feel stressed about every calorie we put in our mouth because, right, it's going to make us fat. It, it makes meal times very challenging and very difficult. We're not relaxing. We're a bit stressed. We're not getting the nutrition. So maybe it's better to give up the diet and eat foods that, that are good, that we really like, and we'll probably end up doing better. So, I mean, that, I just think that's incredible. I've never heard of this stuff before I did this research. Yeah, and I, I have to say, uh, although it's been quite a few years, I mean, I, I worked when I was younger as a pretty high-level personal trainer, and I've studied a lot of nutrition and, and fitness-related topics, and I've never actually heard that. <laughs> so that's really fascinating. And it really makes me wonder, too, so, okay, that's one example, right? So that's, that's how being in a state of pleasure affects food. But if you, if you realize that your state of mind, your mood can have that effect on your digestion, well, how much of an effect does it have on all of the other aspects of your life? Absolutely. So one of the really interesting things is how it affects our immune system. So there was this book back in 2003, uh, Feeling Good is Good for You, uh, written by two doctors. And I'll tell you what, this book came out and dropped into oblivion. There's You can't hardly find any information about it online. And I can't couldn't believe it because the whole thrust of the book is that pleasure supercharges our immune system. So uh, it makes it more active, more productive, more lethal and more protective. Mm. That's what those pleasure chemicals do. And, and the book says, you know, and we're not talking about 
you know, kind of weird pleasures. All we're talking about is things like watching a funny movie and cuddling with your with your partner and petting a dog. You know, these little things actually make you healthier. So, you know, what happens when you get cancer, say? You freak out because, oh, my God, you might die. And you go to doctors and they're telling you all this stuff that's just overloading you. And now you've got to go to chemo and now you've got to do this. And now you got to that. And you are so stressed. And your body's in freak mode, right? Emergency, emergency. You need to get back to chill mode if you want that chance to heal. And so no wonder things like, you know, meditation, things like even, you know, they say being prayed for, anything that can help your body relax and restore is going to help you get better faster. And so we should be telling this to people who are ill. Mm -hmm. You know, sick people need as much pleasure as they can get in their life. And Dr. Christiane Northrup uh, did a, a very, it wasn't a study. She just did an informal show of hands at an event saying, asking women, ever since you've committed to pleasure in your life, has your health got better? And so she said she was amazed at the number of women who found that pleasure actually affected their health, especially people uh, who are struggling with chronic health conditions. Mm -hmm. So, and we think of things like, I mean, this I don't have any research for, so I just want to say it, but we think of things like when people are struggling with infertility and every time they have sex, it's fraught, right? Because mm -hmm. are we going to be able to make a baby this time? Are we going to, is, is going to happen this time? And then after a certain point, maybe they give up or maybe they adopt. So there's no pressure, no pressure anymore. It's, it's fine. If we don't have a biological child, we're good. And then boom, <laughs> you're pregnant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonder if pleasure has mm. something to do with it. Well, I know it works for me. Uh, and we have a friend too who's single, but also has um, some friend that shows up every now and then to help her feel more pleasure. And every time she gets on the Marco Polo app where I get to see her face, I'm like, she looks really good. She got laid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we can track her dating life by what she looks like in her polo messages. Yeah, yeah exactly. By the tone of her voice and the way she looks. And mm -hmm. it's subtle little changes, but there's just like more... Um, yeah, perks in the, in the way she looks and just like the voice and it's it's fascinating. So for all of you listening and even us, I'm like, I want I want us all to really take a pledge for more pleasure, but in whatever way that looks as that, that looks for each one of us, because there's not one definition like what Amy was sharing was sharing earlier. It's really all about finding what lifts you up. So I want to invite you all to really commit today to doing at least one thing on that pleasure list that's really just for you and seeing how it impacts your day. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're almost out of time on our episode. Actually, we're a little bit over, but I love this conversation. <laughs> so we're going to take this a little bit longer than we normally do. There's one question that I really wanted to ask during this interview. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in your book, uh, in a, a lot of the chapters, you have a little section where it's like the inner bad girl is giving advice. And what I think is, is really cool about that is when you think about pleasure, most people think, okay, there's these certain things in pleasure that are acceptable, and then there's these things over here that I really want that I'm not supposed to ask for. And uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about what you mean by the inner bad girl and, and how you can use that to increase your pleasure. I love that because so you've got to realize I come from this background, like I said, pioneer blood. You know, we're the sort of people who leave behind luxuries and pleasure and we just work our way to the grave. <laughs> and so someone like me who's grown up associating hard work and deprivation with virtue and luxury and niceness with, with depravity, <laughs> you know, we need a little bit of help because we need to start shifting around our value system. And so what I say is that inside all of us, all of us, except for you guys, I guess you guys have an inner bad boy. All of us <laughs> women have an inner bad girl inside. And if you want to kind of give her a, a, a vision in your head, you can think of that bad girl that you remember from high school. And I can bet that in your high school, when I say who was a bad girl, you know who she was. <laughs> she was the one who was having sex. She was the one who the boys couldn't, you know, they loved her. She was the one who also probably got in trouble. And she didn't care about what anybody thought. So I want you to imagine that there is somebody like that inside of you. And this inner bad girl only cares about what she wants. It's 
all she cares about. She just cares about what she wants. And you can be good on the, you know, this, it's okay. You can listen to her. And I want you to listen to her every so often because we women are so concerned with being good. We're concerned about doing the right thing and doing everything right and making sure everybody else feels good that sometimes it makes us feel bad and selfish and wrong to think about our own pleasure. So if you can start developing a relationship with your inner bad girl, let her voice all the things that you wouldn't. Like if she just wants to eat an entire bar of chocolate and you're like, but, but my diet, but oh, that's just not me. Maybe you could have a conversation. Why do you want that chocolate? And, and maybe she'll tell you. And maybe because they will, maybe we can come to a compromise. Listen to her, listen to her and let her, let her remind you that pleasure, craving pleasure, indulging pleasure doesn't make you bad. It makes you in touch with everything you are. So one last thing that I want to add is, uh, one of the ways that we can we can make sure we we commit to pleasure and we continue to to prioritize pleasure in our lives is not only to develop a relationship with our inner bad girl, but also to enlist a pleasure posse. And in fact, uh, Celine and I had our own little pleasure posse there for a while. Your pleasure posse is a group of girlfriends or guys, a group of guy friends who are going to help you in your commitment to pleasure. All of you are going to commit to getting more pleasure in your lives. And maybe every time you meet up, you're going to ask each other, what did you do for yourself this week? What did you do that made you feel really good? And you're going to encourage each other and you're going to support each other. And you're in, in, when one of the girlfriends says, well, you know, I didn't have any time to do anything because this project is really important and I put in the long hours, you're going to say, right, the minute the project's over, let's go do something amazing and fun. And when you do this for your girlfriends, you're not just helping them be happier, you're helping their health, you're helping their love life, and you're helping them live longer. So pleasure is not is is not something you can just, you know, like my family said, you can't, uh, oh, pleasure, that's for other people. Pleasure's for you. So, mm. so go out and claim it. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm, absolutely. So Amy, tell us um, how people can get a hold of your book and then get connected to you and your work because this was so juicy and there's so much more. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you can find me at yourbrilliance.com. And if you would like to learn a little bit more about this, including the hedonistic theory of attraction, mm-hmm. you can get a free report called the three A's of attraction. And unfortunately, just for women, it's not for men at the moment. And you can find that at yourbrilliance.com slash free dash gift. Awesome. Well, I feel like we just barely scratched the surface. There's so much more. So I highly encourage our listeners, if you're interested, please go check out her work, find out what she's up to, dive deeper into pleasure. And get a pleasure posse. So remember your brilliance.com and then uh, your brilliance free gift and all these links will be in the show notes. So go check them out. Awesome. Thank you, Amy, for being our guest today. It was amazing conversation, so inspiring. Thank you, Celine and Kevin. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody, that's our show, and we will uh, see you next week. We hope you liked this episode of the Love Lab podcast. If you enjoyed this show, leave a comment and share it with your friends. And if you want more, we have an entire digital library with the best sex tips and relationship advice at CelineRemy.com. That's C-E-L-I-N-E-R-E-M-Y.com. So join us in the sex vault to continue this adventure. Thanks for listening. And remember, you're amazing. <laughs>